about that and you know how often you know and it goes right along with and today today's word went right along with uh, what I'm preaching about today it's I was telling Peg I might take all week to uh, to work on a, a message and then I'll think okay I know where I'm going with this and then Sunday morning all of a sudden it shifts and that's kind of what happened um, it's been as of this week it's been a year ago since my mom passed and, you know, we all have different, oh, uh, what's the best word, emotions through all that. We all do. Different, you know, different people in our lives that have gone before us and so on. And ironically enough, her best friend just passed. Isn't that interesting? Exactly a year later, within a few days, her best friend passed. And ironically enough, my best friend from high school his mother just passed exactly a year after my mom did. So I thought that was interesting. So this morning, I got to, uh, you know, I'm sitting there. Most of you know that at 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, I am up working on my message uh, that God has given me over the week. And I noticed that some of the people that I am very close to on the West Coast were awake. You know, when the little green light comes on on your messenger thing. So I, I sh shot this one friend of mine who just lost his mom. I shot him a quick message. Hey, are you there? Because sometimes, like, you know, we leave our phones on or whatever. And he, he, he so it was like 2 o'clock in the morning there. And as I said, you know, are you okay? You know, I'm praying for you, thinking about you, and so on. And uh, I just told him what my message was about today. And, you know, it, it's interesting because today's, the word that was spoken right before, the, before we went on camera basically was talking about listening to the voice of God and God alone and not listening to the voices of this world. And that is so, so true. And Pastor Tim's opening, when it comes to talking about listening to the instruction manual, which of course is the Bible, but it's also the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And if you don't allow him to work in your life and move and, and you, you don't hear the voice of the Lord through the Holy Spirit, you only get partials. And sometimes, that, well, a lot of times, that's very dangerous. And the more I talk to people on the outside, that they, they and, and you know, have you noticed as we get older, people that we know that were kind of eh, on the fence about the Lord, suddenly, because of, I would say, because deep down, we're starting to realize that our mortality, you know, we're getting older, and more and more of our friends and relatives are passing away. So a lot of people that I know of that were kind of on the fence about the Lord before, they're coming around. But they still have the world's thoughts about the Bible, like about angels. A lot of people think that when you die, you become an angel. You know, hey, you're, that's a demotion. You get that? That's a demotion. When you die... You get to help. You get to you get to be with Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Okay, the angels aren't sitting at the right hand of the Father. You know, and so there are things that people have taken over the last you know ten, twenty, forty, fifty, sixty years from the world's way of thinking that that it's it's off a little bit. And today, I really want to talk about your encourager. And we need to be each one's encouraged. You know, I was just busting on the one young man who's turning 21 that, that I remember when he was just a little thing. You know, a lot of people say, well, I, you know, time doesn't fly that fast for me. The older we get, the faster time flies. And you can actually look back and see when somebody was this tall with no beard. Now he's this tall with a beard. You know, it's just, it's so interesting. And... The exciting part is when you know a person has been raised in the admonition of the Lord. And they, they, so they have, they're one up on their, their co-worker that never was. So today, I want to ask you something, or a statement that I've, I've thought about. That in the last three years, have you felt useless and alone, rejected, depressed, anxious, like nobody really cares. Have you felt like that at some time or another in the last three years? 
No, all right, you all have been great. You haven't felt that way. That's good. Okay. <clears throat> oh, I didn't see you. Well, if, don't raise your hand. okay. I, honestly, the, the challenging thing is we all deal with these kinds of emotions. We really do. And, and how we deal with them really depends on our relationship with our Creator. I was talking to a young man a few days ago on Messenger, and uh, he's dealing, he's, when I say young, he's younger than me. That, that makes it pretty good. And uh, he's dealing with some, uh, some family issues where a relative of his um, had to have ID, you know, when you get your ID made, you check one of the boxes. Well, now, now one of the boxes is neither or transgender or whatever. And it really bothers this father that I, I've been talking to. And, he's, and he keeps asking me the same question over and over. What does all that mean? You know, what kind of identity is that? And I finally just said, you know, it matters to your creator and to his creator that he is who he was made to be. We're born a certain way, and that's how God created us. When, when it all comes down to it, when we stand before our Creator, whether you are saved or not saved, when you stand before God, you can't say, well, I was confused, so I turned into this or that or that. God will say, I, I made you a man, I made you a woman, one or the other. So I, just, I, I basically shot a message back to the young man. I hope he's watching. And I just said, the Creator knows exactly who you are. And if you know him, or he knows him, he is a child of the king. And we need to go from there according to what the word says. And the, our creator loves us. Do you realize, and I, I saw this, and I, was, I, I messaged it to my sons, uh, that and it was really a neat little video saying that, that I, I am your greatest encourager. I am... Um, I'm in your corner. I'm, I'm, I'm there for you. You know, you're everything to me. And I mean that with my kids. My life is, it revolves around my creator and my family first. That's the important thing to me. And it means a lot to me. And I want to be my children's encourager, promoter, and their cheerleader in their corner. Today I want to tell you, that God is your greatest encourager, your greatest promoter, your greatest coach, your greatest cheerleader. He's not up there booing you. He's not. He's up there going, come on, Rob. Come on, Gary. Come on, Juwan. You can do this. Come on. You can make it through this. It's only for a moment. I heard somebody say the other day, remember the Bible says that uh, our lifetime is just like a puff of smoke, like a, just, a, just a, a second, a split second in time compared to all eternity. And we need to remember that. When I first, and I, I've shared with you my different stories, but when I first went to high school, I wasn't in sports. I, uh, I just tried to survive. I don't know how many of you felt that way. Just go, survive, because through, from sixth grade all the way through junior high, I was constantly bullied. I was either fat or I had acne, you name it, one or the other. And I just, by the time I was in ninth grade, that's when high school started. i got to make sure I'm right. 10th, 11th, no, it was 10th grade when high school started. I was at a point where I was fed up with the world. I wasn't a Christian, but I was fed up with being bullied. So I tried to make myself better so I could fight back and so on. And I told you before that I tried boxing that my 10th grade year, and I got whooped real bad. I didn't have anybody who taught me how to do it, didn't teach me how to be, get into uh, in any kind of uh, shape at all, and it was terrible. Well, the next year, so right after that happened, one guy came up to me, and he was teasing me. He said, you did really good with blocking all his punches with your face. I said, oh, thanks a lot, Mr. Encourager. But from then on, he became my, like, my coach. He started working with me in bodybuilding and weightlifting and in boxing. And the, the next year, I've told you this before, the, the second fight that I had was um, 
a split decision instead of a, an easy one. You know, so the judges had to really decide on, on who won. And uh, the, I ended up, I lost, but I was a lot better off because I had somebody in my corner. I had somebody with experience. I had somebody showing me what I needed to do. And he also could see from his perspective what the other person was like and what the other person was doing. But it was only perspective in the human area. And I, I thought about that. In fact, I messaged him. He's the, he's the gentleman who lost his, his mother a year ago. He's the one I messaged this morning. And I told him, I said, you know, you were my coach. You were in my corner. You were my encourager. And that's awesome. But you need to know something. Your greatest encourager has to be God. Because everybody else is going to let you down. Sooner or later, somebody will let you down. And, and, and their perspective will, will be, and I don't, I don't like to say tarnished, but kind of like tarnished with the stuff of this world. If you have a strong relationship with your Lord and you're in the Word and you're praying and you're worshiping, you're going to find something out. That your Creator has so much He wants to tell you and encourage you with. And so this morning, again, I want to tell you that you have the best coach in your corner that you could ever have. But you have to come to that realization. And you have to allow him to coach you. If any of you ever saw any of the Rocky movies, which of course I saw all of them, but in one of them, you know, he basically coached himself. He got first one, he got beat real bad. Second, third one, he had coaches. And in one, the one coach said, when I tell you to switch directions in your fighting stance, you need to do it. And so he gets to that point in there, and he goes, okay, you need to switch now. He goes, oh, I'm not going to switch. He said, no, you need to switch. You're going to throw your opponent off. So he's sitting there going, come on. And so finally he finally listened to the coach, and he won. But often we don't listen to the coach. Often we want to do it on our own. A lot of us, we were raised with a, a very prideful, and, and I, I don't, I'm not trying to say this is a, evil thing, but it is a worldly thing that our parents or our fathers, you know, they raised us up to be strong men, be, be this and, you know, stand up and be full of pride and so on. But what ends up happening is we put our father, God, our creator behind us, and we try to do it on our own. We do. And a lot of men, honestly, you know, we're, we're guilty. We're guilty of that. And I've seen that over and over where people will want to, they're a self-coach. Well, I know I can do this. I was raised this way. And up, up until the very end, I'm going to do it this way. Well, the key word is I'm, I'm, I'm. And you're going to be miserable until you give it over to him, over to your creator. So it's interesting how one year's difference in my little boxing career made a difference having that coach. Now I thought, well, it's great to have mentors. We all need mentors. We need people that encourage us. But we can never put our ultimate, create our coach or our encourager on the back burner. He always has to be number one. Your spouse can be your encourager. Yes, that's true. But ultimately, you have to make sure it's your relationship with the Father. I remember one member of our church who has gone on to be with the Lord. He used to tell his wife all the time, don't worship me, worship the Creator. You're putting a target on my back. You're putting a target on my back because if something happens to me, you're going to fall. He'd say that to his wife all the time. Some of you know who I'm talking about. And when he passed away, I have no idea how, how that person's doing. Because that person, I don't, as far as I know, did not make God the Creator her ultimate coach. Now maybe now he is, I don't know. But that, when he used to say that to me, I said, man, man, I hope I don't worship my wife like that. Yes, she is my greatest encourager next to God the Father. And so, so husbands and wives make sure, you know, and kids, you know, that how things line up according to your, your priorities. So I started thinking about who was the person in the Bible that most of us can relate to that understood 
what it was like to have God in our corner. So all of you go to Psalm 23, so you automatically know who I'm talking about. Psalm 23. But I'm going to read it from the Amplified, and it's interesting. I know Pastor Tim, well, he doesn't have his Amplified open, but this is the classic Amplified. In the classic Amplified, Psalm 23, again, a very well-known scripture, but King David, I believe, now he was as far from perfect as you know all of us can admit. I honestly believe God kept that in the Bible, kept who King David was and all about him so that you and I could relate. Psalm 23, starting in verse 1, says, The Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide, and shield me. I shall not lack. Verse 2, He makes me lie down in fresh and tender green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. He refreshes and restores my life, myself. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with him, not for my earning it, but for his namesake. Verse 4. Yes, though I walk through the deep, sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil, for you are with me, your rod to protect, your staff to guide. They comfort me. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My brimming cut, cut, brimming cup runs over. So it says, one verse says, my cup runneth over. Verse 6, surely or only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And through the length of my days, the house, uh, the through the length of my days, the house of the Lord and His presence shall be my dwelling place. It says, "You anoint my head with oil; my brimming cup runs over." What? Really? So everything that's listed in those six verses, do you get it? He's doing it for David's good. He's using using that to show you and I something very important, that he takes care of us in every possible way. And David shared that, and it's probably one of the most uh, popular verses that you hear. A lot of non-Christians, they know, you start to say Psalm 23, and they can, boy, they can just whip them babies off. You know, all six verses, pretty close to it. And as I, as I learned more about the filling of the cup, or concerning the full cup. The Lord God our Father is the only one who can fill your cup up until it overflows. He is the one who can let your cup run over and satisfy your thirst. And I, I thought a little bit about that. I kept thinking, how many of you have ever been so thirsty that you couldn't wait to get a cold drink of water? You know, have you been there? And honestly, I go back all the way when I was 13 years old. You're going to laugh about this. 13 years old, it was 105, 110 degrees, southeastern Washington. I was out in the middle of an onion field, weeding onions with a knife. Don't ask me any more than that. But all day. And nobody told me I could take a break and go get a drink of water. I finally found out I could, so I went and got a drink of water. But I was so thirsty all day. I thirst like I couldn't believe. And finally I found out that there was a spring, and the spring was so cold. And it was a fresh spring. It was a, it was a creek spring, if you want to call it. So you could drink out of it and not worry about getting some kind of disease. And I remember this. I didn't find that out, though, until the like third or fourth day of working for this man. After the first day, I wanted to quit because I was so thirsty and I couldn't get a drink. I couldn't fulfill my basic needs. I was so angry. I told my mom and dad, I said, I'm going to quit this job. And they looked at me, yeah, right, buddy. You're not quitting nothing. You get your butt back there, is what they said. And I worked for the old guy. He wasn't old at the time. But I worked for him for until I was 15 or 16, and then off and on all the way until I was 18. And he taught me so much. But what's interesting, I'll never forget that, that fresh water that, that totally took care of my thirst. 
And then I attribute that to when I got to a point in my walk with um, this world that I got fed up with the world and I was thirsty for something more. And that's when God told me he would quench my eternal thirst. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Song I, I, I preached about a few, few months ago or a year or two ago, I can't remember exactly when. It's that song uh, called Fill My, Fill My Cup by Andrew Ripp. You hear it on the radio all the time where he says, been walking to a city I cannot see through the depths of the valley where the sun can't reach. I've been high and I've been low. I've been looking for the river that, that could fill my soul. I've been walking to a city I cannot see. Fill my cup, Lord. Fill my cup till it's running over. I thought, boy, that song goes right along with Psalm 23. Well, if you listen to the song, it really sounds like Psalm 23. Another part of it says, been walking over lies standing in my way. They can say they want. I don't want what they say. I was born far from home, but I've been thriving in the wonder of the great unknown because I'm drinking from the well from another place. Oh, fill my cup, Lord. And you know, when I was young in the Lord, I didn't understand what that all meant. I didn't understand that God could help us thirst no more. In that song, it kept playing over and over in my mind all week. So I would play it on YouTube over and over again. I, any of you ever do that, I, I do it all the time. I turn up the music until my wife says, turn it down. I put the headphones on, and then I really jam out. And then she, she sneaks up behind me and touches me on the shoulder, and I jump up and... None of you ever do that either, right? I just, I'm, I'm a very um, uh, excitable person, I'll just say that. But I love listening to that song because it's so real to me. It's like, oh man, fill my cup, Lord, until it's running over. Do you have an empty place inside of you? I'm not talking about an empty stomach, but an empty spirit. See, I had that. Even though I was born again for three years, I had that emptiness. Something wasn't quite there. I told you for three years after I got saved, I lived like a devil. People say, well, you can't. Well, I did. I know I was saved, but for three years, I just, I, I was thirsty for something that could quench my thirst. Many of you people out there that drink, you'll say, well, all I need is a beer to quench my thirst. Honestly, that's got to be a lie. Beer never quenched my thirst. It never did. And it just made me more thirsty. It made me want to drink more so I wouldn't have to taste the trash. After three or four, you can't really taste it anyway. But it never quenched my thirst. So, so don't tell me, oh, I drink it because it quenches my thirst. Oh, that's a lie from the pit of hell. But you and I both know the devil uses that other way, doesn't he? To, to uh, cause us to be addicted to different things. But I had that, that desire to have something empty inside of me filled up. And little by little, as God brought people into my life, and I finally accepted those people in my life, how many of you have had good godly men and women come up to you, try to minister to you, try to share with you, and you pushed them away? We've all done that. You might be watching this right now, and you've done that. Maybe you say, well, I can handle this on my own. For a while, sooner or later, you're not. Sooner or later, you're you're going to be like I was. You're at the bottom of the barrel looking up. You only see one thing. You can only go up from there. You get to that point. And look out because your greatest encourager, your coach, is in the corner saying, okay, come on now. I'm going to show you how to get out of there. I'm going to show you how to, uh, to quench that thirst. As believers, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we will be filled, according to Matthew 5, 6. We are to attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, according to Ephesians 4, 13. So what do you do when you're empty? When I'm empty, a bit more, when I'm spiritually empty, when I have those moments, I know none of you ever do, but I'm a little short-tempered. I can get angry, I shout out more. I, I quickly get irritated. Uh, I'm more emotional. I know none of you are like that. Most of you don't ever have to deal with your emotions, but I do. When you're ADD and you're emotional, it can be wild. It can be fun. It can be laughable sometimes, but it can be very, 
very challenging. Sometimes I'll try to use my friends and my kids and my wife, um, different activities to, to fill that emptiness, that spiritual emptiness. And you know, it always comes back. It doesn't work. And then the Lord just says, when are you going to open your word, open my word, and drink? When are you going to listen to the worship and drink? I was watching, um, I don't know how I ended up getting it, but uh, Michael W. Smith in Tennessee in 2021, he had a big concert, and it was powerful. So I, I, I clicked it on, and I'm sitting there, you know, surfing my internet stuff and doing my thing. And all of a sudden, all these old songs from 10, 15, 20 years ago, they started replaying them. And then, you know, of course, they brought, he brought C.C. Winan on and all these other great people that I really enjoy. And the music was just, I just finally, I just turned it up. I said, Lord, I needed that. So out of like an hour and a half, two hours worth, I ended up listening to like an hour and 30 minutes. It was great. And you know what it did? It began to fill me up. And, and you know what? As I got filled up, I started having more of a desire of my listening to my coach again. How about you? Do you, you know what I'm saying? But when you listen to the stuff and the old stuff, the people that are discouragers, what do they do? They drag you down. And pretty soon you don't want to hear anything positive. But there's something inside of you if you're born again. That Holy Spirit inside of you was sitting there saying, Yo, I'm here. Are you ready? And God will bring somebody or something into your life because he is. He's the greatest coach. He's the, he's the greatest of everything. And that, that's, that's, that's my encouragement for all of you today. Let him fill up the emptiness in your life. And, and you're saying, well, if you're born again Christian, you shouldn't have emptiness. Guess what? You're going. You, there's religious people out there that they'll sit there and say, I'm fine. Everything's perfect. I have no problems whatsoever. Um, because I'm born again, I don't do this, I don't do that. And then you find out six months later they've fallen. Because they just, and I'm not saying you go around admitting all these things. I'm just saying to yourself, say, you know what? I need him. I need him more, more, and more every day. I can't do it on my own. You know, yes, when we're young and we're full of tes testosterone, is that what it's called? You know, we think we can do it all, but we can't. Sooner or later, you're going to find something out that I learned at a very young age. There's always somebody bigger, badder, and stronger, and, and hardier than you. There's always going to be somebody who can beat you in all kinds of areas. But there's one that will encourage you that cannot be beat that has never, ever, ever lost a battle. And that's God the Father. He's, he's never been surprised. He's never said, oops, I missed that. Man did. But God has never, ever made a mistake. I love the scripture in Ephesians 5.18 where it says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with who and what? The Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. See, too many people don't preach about the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Catholics are one up on us. They always, they always put all three together. Too many uh, denominations leave out the Holy Spirit. Or, oh, you know what? You know, he's just kind of there. No, you and I need to realize the Holy Spirit, he is so important in our life. He is, he's the one that speaks to your heart. Your encourager says, yo, you can do this. And like Pastor Tim said earlier, you have to come to a point where you know his voice and not the world. Where you tell the world, no, nah, no, nah, I'm sorry. No, that, that's not good. Has, has anybody ever come up to you and said, they try to sell you something? They try to give you, oh man, I want to sell you the bit. This, this is going to do everything for you. I, I, I I would say the thing on TV the most is the weight loss commercials. Guaranteed, you're going to lose a thousand pounds. Oh yeah, you know, I'm just exaggerating, of course. But everybody's guaranteed. Or if you buy these meals, you guaranteed to go broke. I'm sorry, you're guaranteed to lose weight. Okay, I mean they they are they guarantee. 
guaranteeing that. And if you believe that, man, I have some swamp land, you know, in Antarctica to sell you. Just God tells you and I that we need to listen to his voice. I love the part where Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. And he says, he said, that Jesus said, he has the life-giving water that she needed. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is the source of living water, and I, who, and I love this, Jesus is the source of living water, who know the gift, whoever knows the gift have access to the living water. If you know him as your personal savior, you have access to that living water. Jesus' water fills the emptiness in your soul where the water runs. It fills the gaps and the cracks that fill you up. That You ever notice we all have, have those gaps and the cracks and different things in our lives that really mess us over. And if we're not careful, what happens? They keep splintering and getting worse and worse. But his water will fill those up, seal them up, and he will bless you beyond anything you can imagine. Amen. Imagine a life led not empty, but in the living water, sloshing all over the place. I love that. You ever thought about that? If you're so full of it that it splashes all over everybody else. You're going, what? See, everybody thinks it's a, it's, it's a, um, a tithe message. In Luke 6, where it says, given, it shall be given to you, pressed down, um, you know, shaking and running over. With this measure, you will... Okay, And that is a great tithe message, don't get me wrong. But as you receive that living water over and over again, pretty soon it's got to go somewhere. When you get all filled up pretty soon, all that lovely, excellent, praiseworthy, Christ-like water has got to go somewhere. And wouldn't it be cool if it kind of splashes on other people? But do you allow it to? Or do you just kind of keep it to yourself? Do you share it where you go? Yesterday I was at at one of the local hardware stores, and this gentleman was walking. They, they just changed everything up at this hardware store. So I walk in. I don't even look anymore. I said, where is it? And uh, so I'm looking around. I find what I need. And, and uh, this gentleman was walking around like, like me, you know, like, ah, I can't find anything. I said, what are you looking for? And he told me. I said, you just got to ask somebody. And he goes, well, he's a man. Men do not do that. Don't do that. I walked up to one of the people. Where's the cocking guns at? He goes over by the cock. So I said, really? So he goes to show me. I, I motioned to the, I don't even know who this guy is. I said, and there it was. Because it wasn't where he expected. You know what I'm saying? But he was a man full of pride, did not want to ask anybody. Well, if I've learned anything, I'm learning more and more. I need to ask this. And I, I do it daily, weekly, hourly, moment by moment, whatever and whenever I need to. And, and there are times your spirit just knows which way to go, doesn't it? Do you ask the Lord, hey Lord, fill my cup this morning. You, you wake up in the morning, you go, oh man. Or you wake up, oh, I'm ready to go. I am not that person. I, I said, Lord, I got to turn some music on. I got to have my cup of coffee. got to have my breakfast. I, you know, it's like um, those old, what do they call those uh, hit and miss engines in the old days, the tractors and stuff. That you, you know, they would get something spinning and get it started slow but sure. Once it got going, that baby was going. You couldn't stop it. That was me. But there's some people, they wake up, I'm here, world, you know? I had a niece that when she'd wake up as a baby, she, she'd wake up like that. She'd wake up laughing and smiling and cooing. Not crying. She hardly ever woke up crying. She'd wake up laughing, cooing. I mean, even when she'd get her diaper changed, she was laughing, smiling, and cooing. Now, is she that same person? Unfortunately not. But when she was a baby, I'll never forget that. I said, what well, baby wakes up not crying? She just looked up, hi world. And I honestly believe she got that from her father. Her father is such an interesting man. 
you hardly ever hear a negative word come out of his mouth. He's always Mr. Positive. It's like, sometimes you just want to slap people like that, don't you? Like, you know, you don't have to be positive all the time. But I do appreciate that about him. Because I saw it in his daughter, later in his son, who is now a senior pastor. And he's a very positive man. And he's a very positive father and a very positive husband. When you post something on Facebook, people, everybody sees it. And he, he posts encouraging words to his wife. And at first I thought, who wrote that note to your wife? All of a sudden, his signature was at the bottom. Like, okay, okay, I get it. So do you wake up, Lord, in the morning? And I do. More and more, I'm saying, okay, Lord, fill me up. Get me going. Tell me what I need to do. Use me, Lord, because I don't know if I'll be here tomorrow or the next day, but I know one thing. I'm here today, and I, I, I'm following what you want me to do. Whenever you're feeling empty, you need a filling, just say, Lord, fill me up. And people say, well, you should always be filled up. There's the, there's the denominations out there that said, well, once you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit, and I agree. But you ever notice in Ephesians, it keeps saying, you know, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you need to constantly be filled, meaning you need to constantly remind yourself the Holy Spirit is full in you, and you need to allow Him to work in your life. I don't care how you put it. You need to wake up in the morning and say, Okay, Holy Ghost, I'm all yours. Fire me up. Get me ready, because here we go. If I'm supposed to lay hands on somebody, let it be. Let that person be raised from the dead if necessary. Have any of you ever feared that? Now, I'm just going to share something with you. I told the Lord, one day, I know you're going to have me pray over somebody, and they're going to raise from the dead. I'm not fearful of that, but I'm cautious about that. If I see a car accident, I'll say, Lord, am I supposed to stop? You know? I listen. What am I supposed to do, Lord? You know, or Lord, if I see somebody ahead of me at the grocery store and they're struggling for money, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Do you do that? See, you've got to start out your morning like that because, again, the coach is in your corner and he's going, come on. Come on, people. You can do this. It's all good. I, uh, most of you know I love the, the Father's love letter. I, I use that often. It, they actually have a website called The Father's Love Letter. And, but they also have a devotional. I don't know if you noticed that. But uh, on the devotional number 34 of 53, I loved what this person said about filling the cup. He said, he said uh, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17, this would be God speaking, for I am your greatest encourager. So he went on to say, may, may our Lord, using that scripture, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and, and in, in his word. So when, when Paul expressed that to the Thessalonians, he was just saying, may the Father, you know, be encouraged by the Father. The Father is our great, and then went, this is what they said of the rest of that devotional. The Father is our greatest encourager. He has not come, uh, come to condemn us, but to encourage us and give us hope. And the person said, I believe that he stands on the sidelines cheering us as we race down the field of life, all the while speaking hope into the deepest parts of our being. His shouts of encouragement provide us with the strength that we need. When we need it, in order for us to finish the race that we uniquely is chartered for you and I. I imagine him running alongside of me, speaking words of affirmation as I continue to press on. With each loving glance and encouraging word, my muscles seem to strengthen and my, my endurance increases with the assurance that he loves me and wants me to finish well. When, do I, when I do stumble and fall, I am quickly picked up and reminded that I was never actually running the race on my own, for it was Jesus who has been carrying me all along as he ran in stride with his father. Isn't that beautiful? The father and the son truly are our greatest encouragers. 
May their eternal encouragement bring us hope and provide us with strength that we need in order to run the race set out before us. So I love that devotional. You get a chance, go on to the Father's Love Letter. In fact, I had a person that I messaged earlier this morning. I said, you know, you can't sleep. And I sent him directly to the Father's Love Letter. Listen to this. I didn't sit there and preach at him about all the negative things that they, that they don't understand, but instead listen to the Father's Love Letter because he gives scriptures every time. In the Bible, by definition, encourager is someone who inspires, uh, inspires courage, spirit, and confidence. In the Christian faith, Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians tells us that an encourager in the church is someone who builds others up, according to 1 Thessalonians 5.11. In the Amplified Classic, it says, Therefore, encourage, admonish, exhort one another, and edify, strengthen, and build up one another, just as you are doing. I love that. When you think about what he's saying, it's so important. It's so important that we encourage one another. It's so important that we realize that Christ, the living water, gives us life, eternal life, yes, but even life here on this earth. Encouragement, love, and, and strength. He, he just loves you so much. Jesus' way of life, doing and acting and being, who he was and who he is, is written for us all through the scriptures. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 in the Amplified, it says, Therefore, be imitators of God, copy him and follow his example. As well, beloved children, imitate their father. So if the father is encouraging us, shouldn't we be encouraging others? I would hope so. And it says, And walk in love, esteeming and delighting in one another, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a slain offering and sacrifice to God for you, so that it, so that it became a sweet fra fragrance. So, as I finish up here, I go back to that psalm. He said, like the psalmist does, does our cup overflow with thanksgiving and joy, deep appreciation to our Father and Jesus? Does it really? I hope it does. I hope that you realize that he is your greatest encourager, promoter, and cheerleader. Shouldn't we also do the same for others? So in these dark and uncertain times when people so desperately need hope, as we go about our day, let us do as Jesus did. When our cup runneth over, fill someone else's cup. Are you willing to do that? I hope so. We have to quit thinking always of ourselves and start being there for other people. Be that cheerleader. See, when I grew up, you never called yourself a cheerleader. Sorry, only girls were cheerleaders. Little by little, they started realizing guy cheerleaders were okay. So every time I say that, I get this twinge. There again, there's, that's the way I was raised. But God is our cheerleader. He's the one that leads us and encourages us through Christ and through the Holy Spirit. And we need that. We all, and there are people out there that, you, like I said, the guy at that hardware store, he really was getting bummed out. He was getting angry. I said, man, just go, go over there. Follow that guy. And there it was. Now, he didn't come up and thank me. I hope I didn't embarrass him. I hope I wasn't like that, that commercial where, where it says, do not be your, uh, as you get older, you become like, like your parents commercial. That's the, my son Sam loves to throw that at me. Dad, stop it. I, if I can help people, I'm going to help them. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, my mother, she would always be discouraging to people, but I want to be the opposite. I want to be encouraging. Hey, buddy, your stuff's over there. It's all, it's all good. You know, but it's not easy, but only through his love and his encouragement can you and I truly, really, truly be like him. And when you're bummed out, trust me, he's still in your corner. When you get knocked down, he's still there to lift you up. He's the one that's going to give you the perspective that you never thought about. You know, I, I work with wood a lot. I like to build things. And any time I get fleshy, any time I think I can do it all on my own, and I want to break it into little pieces, my sister could attest to this. I haven't done it a lot in my adulthood, but in my younghood, as a youngster, many of bicycles never saw the rest of this world. I'll just say that. Many things I worked on 
never survived. But as I've got older, and I was sharing with Butch earlier, I said, man, I, I kept having this one problem. And finally I said, okay, Lord, you got to do this. I, put, I turned the lights off and I walked out of the shop. you got to show me what it is. And so I finally walked back into the shop, sat down. Well, you haven't told me anything, Lord. <laughs> That's a bad attitude, isn't it? And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I just got to do this? I said, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to test it to see if God really knows what he's doing. It worked. I know, none of you ever go through that, but I go through stuff like this. Other things are no-brainers. I can tell my son, do this, this, and this. Oh, okay. But guaranteed, you're going to constantly, until you go to be with the Lord, you're going to be challenged in some way or another. Why don't you just let your encourager, your coach, the guy in your corner, show you and tell you what to do. That's my challenge to you today. Remember who your coach is and quit allowing the world to be your coach because the world's going to let you down. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this moment in time that we can thank you for being that life coach, that eternal coach that we've always needed. And because of your son and what he did and that we were, huh, we were blessed and are blessed that he gave his life for us that as we remember in the communion where his body was broken for us and his blood was shed for us, and, and as we, we drink the cup, it reminds us of that blood that overflowed and healed and satisfied everything in the new covenant that needed to be satisfied. I ask that you bless everybody here as they go their different directions, and I just praise you for who you are what your word is doing now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.